Good evening and welcome to the League of Women Voters Candidate Forum for the general election on Tuesday, April 7th. Candidates for the Town of Grand Rapids Board Chair will be featured in the first part of this forum. My name is Gloria Kubishak and I represent the League of Women Voters and I will be your moderator for the first, first part of the forum this evening. We are pleased to bring you this broadcast live on River Cities Community Access, as well as a simulcast on WFHR Radio 1320 on your AM dial. Our viewing and radio audiences can call in their questions at 421-0441. That telephone number should be at the bottom of your screen. The League thanks the candidates for their willingness to run for office, and we would remind you that the League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan organization. We do not endorse any candidates or political party. The candidates for Grand Rapids Town Board Chair are Arnie Nystrom and Carl Herman. Earlier this evening, each candidate drew for the order of speaking. Each of them will have two minutes for opening statements, two minutes for closing statements, and two minutes in which to answer questions. The timekeeper in the back of the room will show them a minute, 30 second, and stop cards. Written questions from the studio audience and telephone questions from our viewing and radio audience should be directed to the office and issues and not to any personality. Only questions pertaining to issues will be asked. Questions also will be screened for duplication. We will begin with opening statements, and we begin with Arnie Nystrom. Thank you. Good evening. Thanks to the League of Women Voters in uh, Wisconsin, uh, or excuse me, River Cities Community Access for this opportunity to visit today about the Town of Grand Rapids chairman race. As stated, being Arnie Nystrom, I'm running for re-election to chairman of the, of the town board. I'm a lifelong resident of Wisconsin Rapids area. I've lived in the town of Grand Rapids since 1976. I'm married to Mary Ann for 42 years. We have one daughter, Dana, married to Steve Brilla, and a granddaughter, Abby, at 15 months. What a joy. I attended Lincoln High School, graduated from Mid-State Technical College. I was named an outstanding alumni there, served on the Board of Advisors there for four years. I finished my working career at H.O. Olding in Amherst, Wisconsin, as their fuel manager, managing 20 plus million dollar budgets over the last 15 years. I retired this year. Feels good. Thank <laughs> you very much. I was elected Grand Rapids Town Board in 1995 as a town supervisor where I served until I was elected chairman in 2013. I've also served six years on Wood County Crime Stopper Board and I've been a member of the Grand Rapids Lions Club for now 40 years. So why have I chosen to run again for town chairman? Shared revenues are down. Taxing limits are frozen. This town needs somebody who has dealt with these issues. Is it important to retain the services that the town residents want? In order to do so, one must manage departmental budgets to allocate the necessary funds to maintain the services needed. I look forward to your answers and to answering your questions today to further help you understand me. Thank you. Thank you, Arnie Nystrom. Carl Herman. I'm seeking the position of town chairman for several reasons. One is to provide a common sense approach to ensure that town services remain safe, secure, and most of all, affordable. Second, borrowing money is not always the correct answer to the solution. Do not spend more money than is collected. Third, keep the citizens of the area informed through transparency and open communications. Having not held public office, I believe this allows me an unbiased view from which to make independent decisions, which will benefit the whole community. My educational background includes a bachelor's degree in political science from UWSP and both criminal justice and aviation degrees. My worldly experience comes from a wealth of knowledge stemming from 32 years of service with the United States Air Force. During my tenure, there's an understanding for and appreciation of how differently the world is governed. Attending town hall meetings provides an insight into how taxpayer dollars are spent. Several items that appear to stand out 
besides having to borrow money to purchase equipment is how much is actually being spent on roads. Spending on road repair or replacement is a small percentage at best, considering the importance. More importantly is the occasional lack of civility towards board members. As chairman, I would impart an open invitation to the community to attend and voice their opinion without fear of disrespect. I would also demand that civility towards the board members in all matters re remain absolutely professional at all times. I have per personally witnessed emotional disdain towards board members and this behavior was completely, completely unacceptable. We can agree to disagree, but when the members of the town board vote, their decisions need not be ostracized. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Herman. We will now go to questions. And if we have radio listeners, the phone number you can call into is 421-0441 to call in your questions for the Town of Grand Rapids Chairman position. We'll start with you, Carl Herman. The first question is, if everything went the way you wanted, what would you have accomplished by the end of your term? That's a great question. Um, I would certainly hope that the services that we provide now would remain intact, that uh, we could look at other ways of funding, uh, purchase of new equipment. I see that there was a, a letter provided by the former fire chief uh, in which he mentions, his name is Dean McCombs, he mentions that there was a long history of fundraising and I believe fundraising is a, is a very good idea to provide for that new equipment. Uh, other than that, I would like to see a little bit, like I say, a little bit more civility when it comes to what is being um, carried on uh, as the town's business and possibly even uh, redoing some roads here in the area and making them a little bit better. Thank you, Mr. Herman. Mr. Nystrom, the same question. If everything went the way you wanted, what would you have accomplished by the end of your term? I think uh, by the end of uh, this coming up term, I'd like to see the uh, buildings, roads, police, fire service, remain at a level of support that can be maintained by the budget. As everyone knows, we're on levy caps. The only way that you can do anything above your levy cap is some people, not a good idea is to borrow money. However, if you do a road project, which was a three, two townships and a uh, village project that is $2.2 million, there's no way can you put the cost of that total road project in one year. You need to share it out. So that's why the town yeah. borrowed $500,000 and it leveled that off so that the levy on the town people could not go up. As I said, the only way the town can raise any additional monies for equipment and or extra road projects over the a normal typical $300,000 would be to borrow. I maintain that the town borrows a very small limit. It's less than 3% of our overall funding that we, expenditures we put out. And it's, uh, it's well within the means. And I expect that we should be able in the next uh, three years, uh, two years, excuse me, it's only a two year term that we'll continue on and complete those projects in order as we see that ones are needed. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nystrom. Next question, and it goes to you, Carl Herman. Does Grand Rapids need a dynamic five-year plan that encompasses all aspects of areas of operations? And it's not specific to anyone, I guess, at this point. It doesn't say that, no. Okay. I, I think looking forward, you should always have a plan, and it should be five or 10 years out um, exactly what what you expect to see in the future and how, how those futures will be funded is very, a very good idea. Um, at the other end of the spectrum, I would like to see more uh, citizen involvement in how that's going to happen and possibly not just by a few individuals on a, on a committee possibly. 
So I would invite everybody to, uh, you know, put their uh, comments in and, and see where this is going and hopefully come up with a good plan. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Herman. Arnold Weinstrom, would you like me to repeat the question? No, thank you. I've got it. The strategic plans are, are great. We just completed the one for the fire department with input from a lot of people, some folks from the police and fire commission, uh, some folks from the town board, a couple of citizens that were out there. Uh, it was presented to the board and, and barely passed on a three to two. And I'm not sure as to what reasons that it, that it, it, uh, it passed or why those people who voted against it didn't. Uh, but uh, it was their choice, and I respect their choice to various different opinions. Now, as far as other plans, we have a, a five-year road plan that's out there now. We've, uh, we just completed the five-year road plan, and now I've uh, proposed the next five-year road plans. And some of these road plans that are looking at are being planned that far out so that we can look to see if we can r receive uh, state funding for a portion of it. There's trip, trip fundings. Uh, we're looking at uh, roads that in one section is over $200,000 to do it. Uh, certainly, if we can find uh, 50 or 75 percent additional funding to do that, that would certainly l lower the cost of it. One of the long-range plans a few years out is 32nd Street, where it drops down uh, before you get to Timberline. It's a big dip down to the Blighter Run Creek. It's uh, outside of DOT standards for what the road grade should be. Uh, we're looking at bridge aid to uh, replace the, the culvert, or bridge as they like to call it and then also would be looking at trip funds to uh, complete that project. Uh, other departments, uh, it's been kicked around for years that the town buildings have a five-year plan uh, that hasn't come to fruition yet. The police department indicated to me recently that they wanted to look at a five-year plan and I'm sure that's gonna start. So pretty much everybody should have a three to five-year plan. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nystrom. I'm just going to take a minute to remind our viewing and radio audience they can call in questions at 421-0441. We'll start with you, Mr. Nystrom, on the next question. Should there, be, should there be rules for public comment at town board meetings? And if so, what should they be? Well, uh, several months ago, I uh, had a request to uh, allow some uh, meeting, some conversations before the meetings and possibly after it. Uh, I looked to Wood County to see how they manage it. Uh, they have a process where they let the folks that want to talk for a couple of minutes. I think they allow five minutes, but I, I decided that it would be appropriate for two minutes and then a closing one. And yes, everyone should be civil. Uh, it's not always the case. There's a lot of emotions in, and some of the topics that come up, and I've tried to uh, maintain a civil atmosphere. If I have to, I'll get a gavel out. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nystrom. Um, Carl Herman, would you like me to repeat the question? Uh, okay. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, I agree with the fact that uh, the public needs to be able to speak. Um, t the two minutes um, is is probably a good idea if you have a lot of speakers. If, if there's a relevant uh, topic that needs to be discussed, maybe we could you know, set a, set a different limit. However, uh, I think at the end of the day, everybody should be allowed to uh, at least voice their opinion and in doing so should not be disrespected in any way. Also, uh, there again, once the town board votes, that vote should be taken as, you know, as it should be and it should be kept professional and, and at that time um, everybody has, everybody on that town board has a right to vote however they see fit and not be ostracized for it. So there again, I do expect that people should show up. This is their community. This is where they live. This is where their tax dollars are being spent and they should actually come and see, you know, where that money is going. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Herman. We start with you on the next question. What are your plans for the fire and police departments? The plans, as far as I understand, the staffing for the police department is pretty much full time. And uh, I, at this point, I have no reason to change that. Um, there is a fire and police commission that, that pretty much handles all that. It's, it's my understanding it's, it's staffed by citizens of our community and they should know pretty much what goes on. And uh, I'm gonna look to them for their, you know, 
uh, expertise in that matter. As far as the fire department, I think we have an excellent fire department. And our, our ISO rating, uh, based on my agent that I spoke to today, well, we're looking where we're supposed to be, which is, is a rating of six. Um, if you wanted to be in as close to a rating of three as possible, like the city of Wisconsin Rapids, it would require huge amounts of money and equipment and personnel. And, and I don't believe that's necessary. I think the department has been growing steadily and it does a very good job doing the things it does do. So I believe I don't have any changes that I would recommend at this time. Thank you very much, Mr. Herman. Mr. Nystrom, would you like me to repeat the question? No, I have it, thank you. The police, the police department is obviously 24 hours, seven for 90 percent, I would say more, more than 98 percent of the time. There may be an occasional time where uh, somebody is on comp time or on vacation time and we may not have a, be able to get one of the part-timers to fill a full shift of it. But for the most part, our chief, uh, Melvin Peterson, that we hired just uh, recently is uh, filling some of those shifts, uh, doing some of the thing. He's out patrolling uh, some of the time, as we would hope that a, uh, a good police chief will do. Uh, understand the equipment needs. Uh, all we need to do is typically with five cars, uh, we need to replace one car a year, and that's basically what we budget for. Uh, Coming into the fire department, the reason for that five-year study was to look at what do we need to do within the five-year study. Uh, one of the things came up is we need to be able to maintain that ISO rating of six. The only way we could get lower would be to have fire hydrants in, in the area, and obviously uh, cost of putting fire hydrants in the township would be exorbitant, so it would likely not something that would happen. Maintain it got to keep the equipment up. You cannot let it fail. You cannot let equipment get to a point where the DOT uh, inspections tell you that it's an out of service item. They need to be fixed on the road, available. We need to look at a schedule of when the next vehicle may be, need to be purchased. Uh, we haven't developed that yet, but it's getting close to the time that we might be able to tell the residents that you would need to expect in seven years that we may need to replace a fire truck or whatever it is. Uh, and we will do our best to maintain that fire district uh, class of six. It means a lot to the residents uh, uh, that we serve in Saratoga and Grant that, were, that are within the five mile radius of the township because they can all, also take advantage of our low ISO rating. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nystrom. We'll start with you on the next question. What would you change about the current budget? I worked pretty hard on the current budget. Matter of fact, I worked uh, very long and hard on the current budgets. Uh, there was some uh, concerns that we did not put enough money into roads. Roads are budgeted at 237,000, I believe. But we have to remember also that we have a $125,000 a year loan for uh, town line roads. So if you put the two together, it's uh, pretty close to $350,000. And it's actually slightly more than we put on for roads every year. So. That budget line is fine. Um, building maintenance uh, always needs to be looked at. Uh, we replaced the roofs not too many years ago, within five years. Those buildings are good. Do we need to energize uh, more efficiently some of the outdoor lighting? Yes, we have. We're putting LED lighting outside the buildings when we can, when they need to be replaced, putting them on more energy efficient stuff. And uh, we'll look at that, uh, things such as hot water heaters and everything else and furnaces to to change the, the buildings to be more efficient. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nystrom. Carl Herman, what would you change about the current budget? So the budget, if you look at it, it's this big and it's about that thick. So it, there's a lot of items to it that are uh, very intricate and without it being able to, uh, to really delve into exactly what, you know, I mean, there's numbers on a paper, but that's about it. So unless you're there on a regular basis uh, to see exactly where the money is being spent, it's tough to say exactly where uh, you can you can make some changes. I do. Uh, I, there was one troubling number I saw, and that was for a, a repurchase agreement for four million eight hundred dollars, and I'm not really sure where that's going to or what that's all about. Um, I would like to look into that and see exactly uh, where where that money's being spent, I guess. Um, other than that, uh, I would like the opportunity to actually delve into that budget. I think more time needs to be spent on it than it, than it initially is. I've seen there was a struggle by certain um, board members to actually understand 
uh, what's in the budget, why it's in there, you know, where we're going with it. So I, I think not enough time is being spent. Thank you. Thank you. Next question, and we start with you, Mr. Herman. Some villages and town boards are considering an additional recycling collection option, food waste and compost. How viable do you think this is for the town of Grand Rapids? Um, I guess we're already recycling, so I'm not sure about the food waste. I, I'm more of a person that thinks that personal responsibility and doing the right thing is left up to the individual. Um, I, I guess we could probably look at a program like this. Will it work? I don't know. Most people, when they're forced into things, don't like to do them. Uh, and at the other end of the spectrum, it becomes a, uh, an albatross around the, the government that has to make it all work. So I, I believe in recycling, but to a certain extent. Some food waste, I remember my grandmother when I was growing up, she would actually recycle them in her own garden, and she used to grow some pretty mean strawberries. So. I guess at the end of the day, uh, that's what we probably should be doing is growing more of our own food. Um, so that's probably where most of that should go. Thank you. Thank you. Arnie Nystrom. Thank you. The uh, thought about the other uh, food streams and that are, uh, it's something that I believe that uh, our uh, garbage and recycling committee should be looking at. I'm not sure if they've had it on any of their agendas yet, but if they haven't, uh, certainly it's an option for them to as to how much cost is added, I don't know. Our garbage this year went up from $115, $115 per person to $131, so that's a pretty substantial increase in garbage and recycling costs on an individual household. So I'm not sure just exactly what additional costs would have to be added. Uh, certainly I would need to know that number before I uh, make any decision. I trust my committees. I point who I think is strong people to the committees and I expect them to do their jobs. Uh, just to backtrack just a minute on Carl's question on re the uh, repurchase. That's actually a term that our bank uses for uh, the, the fund that our monies are saved in when certain times of the year we have larger amounts of money. It, we, by having what's called a repurchase agreement, it's just simply moving money from one account to another account, and there's a slightly better increase in interest rate. Very tiny, but slightly better. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Nystrom. We'll start with you on the next question. In fact, it goes to repurchase agreements. Oh. And the question is, what would you do for Grand Rapids in the area of repurchase agreements? We have a clerk uh, full, uh, that uh, clerk and treasurers that uh, look at those. Our treasurer, Chris Ginner, manages our accounts with the bank. She's done it for every year. She's seeked out all these different funds where we can store the funds because certain times of the year, especially in the first part of the year, the town does receive a lot of tax money until we have to turn that over to the various um, uh, people that get at the school districts and the county and whatever. So the funds we have for some days um, are, are pretty substantial. So she does the best she can, gets us the best rate we can. We search all the banks in the area. Uh, and uh, choose the best rate, and one of them is, is called a repurchase. Thank you. Thank you. Carl Herman, the question is, what would you do for Grand Rapids in the area of repurchase agreements? I think uh, we'll leave that up to the treasurer, uh, Chris Ginter. Okay. Thank you very much. Carl, we start with you next. Much of the reasons region's economy depends on a vibrant Wisconsin Rapids economy. How can the town work to support this and any future land use surrounding the city? I believe that uh, more people should be growing their own food. I'm a firm believer in uh, you know, community supported ag agriculture. I think um, given the opportunity, if we are able to, we should allow and try to um, somehow endorse or help individuals get farms going, at least smaller ones, so that they can grow their own food. And this would cut down on the amount of transportation costs and CO2 and everything else that's being added into our uh, for atmosphere for the, the amount of food being hauled. And I think that would allow us to also, um, you know, give the individuals that normally wouldn't have an opportunity to actually be employed. So in that respect, help in the economy. This area is depressed, folks. I mean, at the end of the day, we're, we're hurting. Um, 
and I don't see any, any viability as far as or any any new ideas other than you know maybe another uh, box uh, box store opening up in the middle of you know selling cell phones but at the end of the day I guess it's a few jobs for people but it doesn't you know I don't think it really provides a, uh, a career or future for them other than uh, a short-term uh, employment so hopefully we can try to make use of the land that we have here and there's a lot of land in the area that isn't being productively used. Thank you Mr. Herman. Arnie Nystrom, I'll be happy to repeat the question. Would you that one, please? Much of the reg region's economy depends on a vibrant Wisconsin Rapids economy. How can the town work to support this and any future land use surrounding the city? City in the city of Wisconsin Rapids, Mayor Rorick and myself have met many times on various little issues, having some conversations on what we could do collaboratively together. Uh, we have an economic development committee that's working with Reggie to see what we can do. Uh, Grand Rapids, uh, the, the city, when they run out of room, and they have not yet, they look to where is there more land in Grand Rapids. And typically what they want is not residential properties. They're looking for open land where they could put additional businesses. Uh, we've suggested to them that it would be nice if they would uh, allow us to have a business or two in Grand Rapids that would could hook to the municipal sewer and water services on a fee basis. That doesn't seem to go anywhere. Uh, as far as uh, the area, I'm very proud to say that Mid-State Technical College is in the town of Grand Rapids. Uh, I support all the projects as I am a graduate of there. Uh, we work with them to determine what type of uh, classes they need. Uh, they teach all our firefighters. Uh, we just had three graduate, uh, and l last evening was his first trip on a fire. He went on one of one of our fires last night. He said, that's hard to believe. I just graduated from class, and I'm on my first fire the same day. And uh, I think I covered it. Thank you very much, Mr. Nystrom. We'll start with you, and this will be our last question before we go to closing remarks. What area of town board spending would you suggest that could result in lower taxes? That's mine, you said? That's yours. Uh, I've always been, a, been a very conservative on uh, my per diems. Uh, previously, going back uh, a number of years, the per diems uh, that was for the chairman was double what um, what I've taken in the last year, and it's roughly just over $6,000. I travel the township every day. I talk to the crews, I talk to the office, I talk to uh, the fire department, I see what's going on. I do not charge a cent for any miles that I drive in the Wood County period. I do not take payments for mileages. I use my own personal vehicle, and now we do have a town vehicle which I can be using, so that's basically where I where I feel the savings can be. Uh, I encourage joint meetings uh, of different committees so that it can be covered under one per diem, uh, therefore saving the taxpayers money. Thank you, Mr. Nystrom. Mr. Herman, the last question. What area of town board spending would you suggest could result in lower taxes? So t this is, um, I, I guess, more of a broad subject than just the spending of the town board members. It's, it's tough to say at this point because I don't have the inner workings of exactly where all the money is being spent. I, I need to actually look to see where the money is going. I, I appreciate the fact that the chairman is actually not charging for you know the mileage that he drives. That's, that's a very good start. And I would hope that uh, the other board members, and I believe they are already doing it, um, would not be excessive in their um, asking of of reimbursements but at, at the end of the day it's kind of a tough question because um, I haven't done it for 22 years and I would love the opportunity to try thank you thank you very much mr. Herman closing remarks will be next you both have two uh, two minutes to do that and we start with you mr. Herman since 2008 the landscape for growth via interest rates and large property tax increases came to an end we are living in a post-growth environment which includes a return to living within our means. Many property owners are near or at retirement age and thus cannot absorb increases to cover our ever-expanding government services. Legacy being left behind is one that cannot survive our current passion for limitless services. We must as a community decide where our tax dollars are best spent, 
before the situation forces us into making poorly thought out decisions. I personally believe everyone should be involved in local government since you have a vested interest in the outcome. Attending town hall or committee meetings will open up a world that many will never see. Short of participation, choosing the right candidate as your representative is equally important. I believe in limited government and personal responsibility. I am the independent thinker, which can remain unbiased, making decisions that will benefit the community as a whole. Thank you League of Women Voters and the River City Community Access Studios for this opportunity today. And please vote for me, Carl Herman, Town Board Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Nystrom. Thank you. Just want to uh, start off with this by saying that uh, the Town of Grand Rapids uh, recently in the last few years started an EMS program. Uh, we now do 230 some calls a year for EMS service for people. We were very proud to find out the other day that since the first of the year, three of the folks that we went out that were non-breathers, we were able to bring back. They are doing fine. Their saves, what we call saves, we're extremely proud of the efforts of our police department, who was sometimes the first one on the scene, or our EMS people. So, again, thanks to the uh, Wisconsin Rapids Area League of Women Voters and River City's Community Access for this opportunity. I'm asked to be reelected to the chairman's position of the town of Grand Rapids. Town of Grand Rapids is the 11th largest town in the state and the third largest in the municipal third largest municipality in Wood County. I'm retired. I'm able to devote the time that's needed to get the job done. I led the Town Public Works Committee when we negotiated fire contracts with uh, Town of Grant and Saratoga. These contracts bring revenues of $154,000 annually into the budget. I helped push for the formation of the town's municipal court. That's a $40,000 plus. Grand Rapids has had a stable tax base and a stable tax rate only increasing 19 cents in the last 10 years. With my purchasing background, I have helped the town be fiscally responsible. The good management processes the town actually ended the last couple of years with slight uh, budget surpluses. To see more about me and on my key issues, you can check my webpage, www.arneenheistrom.com. If elected, I will continue to give the citizens of the Grand Rapids what they deserve, a chairman that will works for the benefit of the town not for their own pet projects. I will continue to look for ways to support their needs. Lastly, I'm a citizen, taxpayer, not a politician. Please vote for me on April 7th, or if you cannot vote then, you may vote in person absentee at the town hall until 5 p.m. on April 3rd. Thank you. Thank you. And this concludes the first part of our League of Women Voters Thank Candidate you. Forum. You. We thank our candidates, Carl Herman, Arnie Nystrom, for their willingness to run for public office, in this case, town chair of the town of Grand Rapids. Our next panel will be for the supervisor positions for the town of Grand Rapids. There are two positions open and there are four candidates. So stay tuned. Please do not turn your radio dial or your TV dial because it's only going to take us a few minutes to rearrange chairs and get set up for the next part of our program. And we encourage you to call in your questions at 423-0441. Thank you again, Mr. Herman. Thank you, Mr. Nystrom. You're more than welcome, and we appreciate it. Thank you.
Good evening and welcome to this evening's forum for the April 7th election. We are in our second part of the debate and in this part of the debate candidates for the Town of Grand Rapids Board will vie for two positions and we have four candidates here tonight. We welcome Patty Lumby, Raymond Anesti, Daniel Paulson, and Benjamin Tilburg. My name is Gloria Kubishak. I represent the League of Women Voters, and I'll be the moderator for this portion of the forum. Earlier this evening, each of the candidates uh, drew for order of speaking, and they will have two minutes to, for opening remarks, two minutes for answering questions, and two minutes for closing remarks. Written questions from the studio audience and telephone questions from our viewing and radio audiences should be directed to issues and not to personalities. Questions will also be screened for duplication. We will begin with opening remarks and we start with Patty Lumby. Good evening, I'm Patty Lumby and I'm seeking re-election as Grand Rapids Town Supervisor. I'm a lifelong resident who has lived within a three mile radius from the municipal building. I believe in this community and I want to help it succeed for future generations. That is why I never moved away. I have experience in customer service, project coordination, small business, and trained in various quality control and quality assurance programs. I work full-time in healthcare as a certified pharmacy technician. I was elected in 2013 for my first term as town supervisor. I have been appointed to serve as an alternate for the airport commission. I have been appointed as a member of the plan commission chairperson for Public Buildings Committee, and a member of the Recycle and Solid Waste Committee. I am an active member belonging to F Pharmacy Society of Wisconsin, of Wisconsin. I love to read and learn for enjoyment. My husband and I garden, canning, and freezing our harvest, and we also enjoy working outside in our lawn and woods. My desire to preserve Grand Rapids as a safe and affordable place to live is what motivates me. I found by going door to door introducing myself that I share the same sentiment of many of, the, of our residents. My goals are simple and have not changed since the last time I ran. Maintain property tax levels, eliminate and, uh, eliminate and identify wasteful spending, and assure community is informed advocating transparency. I believe that transparency, remaining unbiased, and keeping residents informed is imperative in local government. Also keeping an equal and balanced budget to ensure that every department has an adequate operating budget. Thank you. Thank you, Patty Lumby. Our next speaker for opening remarks is Raymond Anesti. Thank you. <coughs> the office I'm seeking is the position of supervisor. The reason for my candidacy is that the primary reason for running is that I've been sitting on the sidelines complaining and not getting involved. I have finally made a decision to be part of the solution and take an active part. My active, by being active means I, make, I will make my decisions based on the best information I can gather and study so that the residents of Grand Rapids will have the best representation that I can give them. My best, rep <clears throat> my best representation will also mean that I will solicit opinions of Grand residents so I can weigh those opinions and make the best decision to benefit the majority. I will use my best common sense and hardworking attitude to give the Rapids a supervisor that you can be proud of. Major decisions need community involvement. I believe that good communication is important to the residents of the town so they can be more involved with decisions that are made. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Onesti. Daniel Paulson. Okay. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank the League of Women Voters, WFHR, and Community Access for uh, you know, putting on this forum. Um, I think it's very important that the uh, citizens of Grand Rapids um, are able to look at our views and uh, get to know us a little bit better. Um, I have, I've lived in Grand Rapids for, for over 25 years. Um, married and have two children um, and two grandchildren. I've um, been on the board for two years. This is my first term all so long. Uh, with Patty and have learned just a uh, tremendous amount how government works. Um, my initial thought was you run uh, the town like you would run your household and after learning through uh, 
the chairman and other board members, um, that isn't always the case. Um, I've always listened to members of the community and tried to base my decisions not on a uh, personal um, opinion or but what would be best for Grand Rapids. Um, like I said, I am a member of the fire department, um, also a member of uh, Grace Lutheran Church. I work for H&S Manufacturing as a buyer with a multi-million dollar budget uh, that I have to uh, um, stay within. Um, the town of Grand Rapids has a uh, lot of opportunity that uh, we can continue on. Um, the board, current board has, uh, has taken some good strides and I look forward to the next two years to continue that. And, uh, thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much, Mr. Paulson. Uh, next for opening remarks is Benjamin Tilburg. Thank you. Hi, and good evening. My name is Benjamin Tilburg, and I'm running for supervisor in Grand Rapids. I'm excited to be here today and tell you why I'm running for a supervisor in Grand Rapids. I'm a father, I'm a husband, I'm a veteran, and I'm a resident of this great town. I've recently purchased a home in November after renting for two years. And there's many reasons why I chose Grand Rapids as my place to live. One of the things is safety. Uh, Grand Rapids is one of the safest communities in Wisconsin. And I think that that goes to uh, a testament to the police and fire department and the job that they've done to keep our citizens safe. Outdoor recreation, Wazitra provides such a fantastic area for all of us to recreate. All of our families enjoy walking, biking, hiking, the list goes on. Mid-State Technical College, as a graduate, I'm thankful we have the opportunity to enjoy uh, online training. Our fire and police department get a chance to, to interact with other, other uh, departments. And I wanna continue to keep supporting this township and keeping it safe. I also like to support our local activities, which bring our communities together. People connected with ac activities come to participate with their families. And I'm sure once they see what Grand Rapids has to offer, they will wanna live here too. I wanna to personally thank the League of Women Voters for holding this forum, River Cities Community Access. I wanna thank the other candidates, and most importantly, for the residents tonight who are watching and get a chance to hear a little bit more about who you're voting for. Thank you. Thank you very much, Benjamin Tal Tilburg. Uh, for our viewing audience and our radio, radio audience, I remind you that you can call in your questions at 423-0441. We are interviewing candidates for the Grand Rapids uh, Board of Supervisors. Our first question, Mr. Onesti Raymond, we will begin with you, and it goes like this. With the town of Grand Rapids being ranked as the third safest municipal municipality in Wisconsin, and the Grand Rapids Volunteer Fire Department having the best possible ISO rating without having a fire hydrant system, what are your plans to maintain or improve these ratings or rankings? Um, I don't think there's much you can do to improve the, the rating the way the things are. Um, difficult question. I really can't answer it. That's just fine. We'll go on to you, Dan Paulson. Okay. Well, that that is true. We are the third safest just came out. Um, we hired uh, just recently, I guess, um, a new police chief, uh, Melvin Pedersen who has done a phenomenal job with our police staff. Um, I wouldn't change a thing. We, you know, the, like uh, the chairman uh, said earlier, there are times when we don't, um, someone isn't on duty, but for the most part, we are a 24-7 um, uh, police staff. And, um, and we are very, very proud of our officers. Um, I make it a point to get down to, uh, um, the police department and talk to the off officers ask them what their concerns needs are from as a board member and um, you know as of late 
they are very pleased with, with the way the police department is running, I wouldn't do a thing. Um, I am a member of the fire department, been so for 25 years or so. So um, I know that department inside and out. Um, we have 56 members currently of EMS and firefighters um, who work um, very hard to maintain that rating and they're very proud of the department. Um, the board has always supported them and um, allowed them to pretty much run the department a as they yeah. see fit. Um, one thing I do feel that is this next board really needs to take a look at is a long-term plan for the, f for the equipment, mainly the trucks. These trucks are in up upwards of a half million dollars um, and down the road we are going to have to replace them. I would like to see us as a board and with, in conjunction with the fire department come up with a long-term plan on when we're going to replace these vehicles. Thank you very much. Uh, Benjamin Tileberg, would you, uh, do you want me to repeat the question? Uh, yes, please. With the town of Grand Rapids being rated, ranked as the third safest municipality in Wisconsin, and Grand Rapids Volunteer Fire Department having the best possible ISO rating without having a fire hydrant system, what are your plans to maintain or improve these rankings or ratings? Thank you. Uh, at, currently, at, I'm, I'm just excited and elated that, that we have uh, the third safest community. Uh, that, that just goes to the testament of the police and fire department on what a great job they've done. Uh, one of the goals of the fire department is to maintain the ISO rating of six. I think that is by far one of the more important things that we need to take a look at. Uh, the strategic plan that was just passed uh, takes a look at the reasons why we need to, uh, to and how to maintain that rating of six. Uh, years ago, the fire department researched uh, and found that going from a, an ISO rating from eight to six saved the town $748,000 for in property insurance. That's, that's a huge saving. By maintaining that level of six, like they have been, that allows the residents to save money on their property insurance, and that is very, very important. Our police department handled 4,538 calls last year. Wow. That, that's amazing. And I think that, that also goes to show that, that uh, they're doing a great job. People need it, people want it, and they're there to help and handle these calls. And they're trained professionals. Um, I, I, I can't go without saying how much and how important it is to maintain our police and fire department. They also do other things with the community. Helping hands, the police and auxiliary do helping hands during Christmas time and I think that's fantastic to interact with the community. It provides five families with food, clothing, and gifts during Christmas time. And so that interaction with the community is super important and appreciate the police department. Thank you. Thank you, Benjamin Tilburg. Patty Lumby, would you like me to repeat the question? No, that wouldn't be necessary. Okay. Thank you. Um, I believe with our current police and fire department, Grand Rapids, well, being its ranking third of the uh, the 50 safest places to live in Wisconsin have come to realize that over time larger or bigger premium departments aren't always necessary or the answer um, not always the answer and I've come to realize over time that fact for example the referendum that the town voted down <coughs> three to one increasing the taxes by three hundred and sixty nine thousand dollars from henceforth was wasn't needed um, under our new leadership um, and the new police chief, Mel Pe Peterson, um, the larger expenditures weren't required in order to um, have our 24-7 police department and the current um, police department that we have. So throwing money at solving a problem isn't, is, is an easy thing to do. However, um, it's more difficult to find a solution, and that is usually what pays off in the long run. Thank you. Thank you, Patty. We will go to the next question, but before we do, a reminder to our radio and television viewing audience, call in your questions for the Grand Rapids Town Board Supervisor candidates at 
0441. We'll start with you, Mr. Paulson, on the next question. It's a little bit long. <laughs> Grand Rapids is part of a small region of many municipalities. Each provide many similar services independently. Would you support partnering with other municipalities to deliver these services? And if so, give an example or two. Yes, absolutely. I, uh, I think that is a key to survival, is, uh, is collaborating with other communities and um, using their resources, them using our resources, sharing resources to get, get the bigger bang for the dollar, okay? Um, we, we do that right now. Um, right now we are working with uh, the community of, of Buren, okay? Um, our, our town crew and their town crew right now are uh, sharing um, different pieces of equipment back and forth. We used to use our uh, streets, uh, hire uh, outside uh, vendor to come come in and and do our street sweeping. Uh, Beeren has a street sweeper that sits sits idle um, quite a bit of the time. Okay, they have offered that to us in return for using some of our uh, bigger equipment to operate um, dig some of their ditches and and use that. That's a key um, to our success. We need to look to the city. We need to look to uh, uh, Saratoga and all of our surrounding communities and try to um, work together on combining some services. Um, also with our fire department, there again, um, the Buren and Grand Rapids have started to work together. Um, we are call, um, in a, on a page, they are paged to our calls, we are paged to theirs. Um, just because of daytime calls and the, the amount of, we used to have a huge amount of shift workers on the Grand Rapids Fire Department, which kind of leveled it so daytime there was just as many as night. Now it seems that the, the shift workers aren't, aren't as prevalent, and so we are looking for other resources from Nakusa, even Beeren especially, to, um, to help us with our fires, and then we in turn are helping them with theirs. Thank you very much, Mr. Paulson. The same question to you, Ben Tilburg. Would you like me to repeat it? No, okay. I, I think partnering with other municipalities on services is, is key in, in survival, like Dan said, and also into uh, cutting back on our budget a little bit uh, with some monies. Um, it's, uh, when I worked on and managed cranberry marshes, uh, many cranberry marshes are nearby each other. And if someone had a backhoe that, that they needed, we shared and then maybe next time there's a greater blade that they needed to. So it's, it's important and imperative that we work with everyone surrounding uh, the town of Grand Rapids. I know in talking with some of the police officers uh, from Wisconsin Rapids and the Sheriff's Department that, that we, uh, we share and help each other out as far as um, uh, with the drug dogs and the, with the SWAT team uh, personnel. If we were to need services in that manner, uh, we, uh, Chief Peterson works with them in order to gain those services. Obviously, as a small township, we don't have the money to, to invest in, in, in such things. But as, as a shared unit, we're able to, to keep our, our townspeople safe uh, through that realm on calls. And I think that's, that's very important. Thank you. Thank you, Benjamin Tilburg. Patty Lumpy. Repeat the question or not? No, I think I'm fine. Oh, Thank good. you. Okay. Um, actually, when I was um, thinking about this question, a lot of um, different avenues we could actually share the services like we do with Wood County Sheriff's Department. Um, they do an awesome job filling in um, empty shifts that we may not have the av availability of filling at the time. Um, the City of Wisconsin Rapids, we uh, work with them also, um, as we currently do with the airport. Um, we have, um, the airport has the city in um, Grand Rapids, and Nakusa and Port is, we all collaborate in order to uh, work together on the airport. Um, zoning administrator is another one that had come to mind when I thought about um, 
the sharing of services. And um, I thought about information technologies would be another excellent opportunity for Wood County or maybe the city to be able to utilize the same um, group of people that they have working for them currently. Thank you very much. Patty Lumby. Uh, Raymond Onesti, mm -hmm. would you like me to repeat that question? No, that's okay. Okay. Um, I think this is just part of being a good neighbor. Um, if my neighbor needs help, I help him. He helps me. Um, I can't think of any reason why you wouldn't do this to save money or, or use your resources properly. Thank you. For those of you who are in our listening or television audience, remember to call in your questions at 423-0441. We'll go to the next question and start with you, Benjamin Tilburg. What area of town board spending would you suggest could result in lower taxes? I think uh, when you're looking at the budget and looking at taxes, um, the Grand Rapids um, Town Board does a fantastic job um, trying to cut the fat and get rid of uh, excess spending. Um, no one likes to see excess spending on projects that you don't need to spend. That, with that being said, we have one of the lowest tax rates in the area. We're lower than Buren, we're lower than Wisconsin Rapids, um, we're less than 60% of what Wisconsin Rapids is. And I think that goes to show uh, as a testament uh, to, the, to the hard work that they've done on the budget. As far as saving money, um, there was a proposed uh, property, uh, countywide property assessment um, in the budget for, for Scott Walker. Uh, and this is supposed to save us money. Um, in fact, it wouldn't save us money. Uh, $25 per parcel um, it would cost uh, the citizens of Grand Rapids if the budget was passed and Wood County assessment were to happen. Uh, the fact is, is we spend, uh, last year we spent, I believe, $16,000 on our um, uh, planning and zoning, per, or not planning and zoning, but our assessment assessments for Grand Rapids. That is, that is a huge savings compared to what it would cost the taxpayers. So as far as property-wide or county-wide assessments, I believe keeping our assessor in Grand Rapids is actually cheaper for the residents. And so, so that's what I would focus on is, is keeping our assessor in, in Grand Rapids and that would actually save the taxpayers money and it wouldn't increase taxes. Thank you. Thank you, Benjamin Tilburg. Patty Lumby. Uh, one of the things that, I, that came to mind from your question would be um, the attorney fees would be um, one that we would be able to save taxpayer money or cut on the budget. Um, and then, of course, um, coming up with a um, um, working together with other municipalities or the county as far as the information technology part. Thank you, Patty. Uh, Ray Onesti. Can you repeat the question? Oh, more, uh, absolutely. What area of town board spending would you suggest could result in lower taxes? I would have no idea. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Ray. Uh, Dan Paulson. Well, it's a lot easier going last than it is first. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it sure is. Yeah. Yeah, I know it's my time's burning up. Here, so. um, first of all, I would continue with partnering with with uh, our other communities and the city of Wisconsin Rapids, the sheriff's department, Beeren, um, Saratoga, and seeing if we could combine services. Um, you know that that again, we we can expand on that. Um, more and more um, each year and as we find out new ideas that keeps going um, long-range planning we have to really look at not only um, our fire trucks but our large um, expenditures you know we bought a grader this year um, I believe it was around 180 
$185,000, okay? That's not a cheap piece of equipment, okay? Rick uh, and Arnie was able to go out, look around what was in the community and um, or in the area and found um, one that fit within our budget, okay? So we, by long-term planning for our dump trucks, for our um, graders, for our backhoes, for our fire trucks, um, I think is key to keeping our tax rate as low as possible. It's fiscal responsibility, but it's long-term planning. So when these big expenditures happen or we know we need to have it, um, there is a plan for it. The other one is keep working on our buildings, making them energy efficient. Um, every year we put um, some money more and more into it, and that only helps us in the long run. And um, this year again, changing some lighting, um, working on some doors, putting in some fiberglass doors instead of the steel ones, which have a much longer um, lifetime, um, I think will, will definitely help us save money. Thank you very much, Dan Paulson. We begin with you, Patty Lumby, on the next question. When an agenda item is voted upon, do you feel a vote of opposition should be explained? Um, some Sometimes yes and sometimes no. Um, I guess we're not obligated to actually um, explain why. And I have to say that sometimes at um, some of the meetings that I have actually voted no against, I felt somewhat intimidated by the people sitting in the audience that I was um, not comfortable with explaining everything as to why I voted no in a certain instance so thank you very much mm -hmm. patty ray anesti question again please sure when an agenda item is voted upon do you feel a vote of opposition should be explained i don't think you have to once you've made your decision um obviously the whole thing's been discussed and decided about and, and that's your choice to make that decision for what you're doing. Thank you, Ray Onesti. Dan Paulson. Um, absolutely. I think 100%. You should explain your, your vote either way. Um, we have an obligation to the our constituents and the people of, of this community to look at uh, the, uh, a vote or something that's coming up as objective as possible. And whether you disagree or, or agree with it um, is, is what we try to do best. Every board member is, is going to try to make the best decision that they think is for the community. And I, don't, I believe that it is our obligation to tell them why we voted the way we did. Now, they may not agree with it, and that, which is fine. We can agree to disagree, but um, as representing them, you know, and they have a question and say, why? Why did you vote like that? I think it is, like I said, our obligation to explain um, to them why we, why we did. Thank you very much, Dan Paulson. Benjamin Tilburg, do you want me to repeat it? No, thank you. Okay. I, I think uh, I, I am on the exact same page as Mr. Paulson. Uh, it is our obligation to give feedback um, detailed reasons on why we voted for something. Our residents, they, they require some sort of, uh, they require an explanation for our voting. If, if we don't believe that uh, a motion should go, go through, um, it's our duty to provide feedback to the citizens. Um, if you vote no on something, uh, the worst possible thing to do would be to, to be quiet about it. Um, and that, that, that's, a, that's a, uh, a very important thing uh, with any vote. If, if you don't provide the citizens with feedback, um, then, then the backbone to your decision um, lays by the wayside because no one knows exactly uh, why you voted or what the reasons are to begin with. If the reasons pertaining to the motion uh, e either support your position or support um, the, the other person's uh, decision to not vote on it. So, so yes, it's our obligation as, as supervisors to provide feedback. Thank you. Thank you very much, Benjamin Tilburg. Just a reminder to our viewing and radio audience, call in your questions for the 
Grand Rapids Town Board Supervisor Candidates at 423-0441. Ray Anesti, we will begin with you on this question. What do you believe is Grand Rapids' greatest asset and how would you capitalize on it? Mm. I think the greatest asset is Lake Wazicha. Um, I think it's already being capitalized because we have the national championship ski tournament coming. Um, just being a rural environment, I think, is an asset to us. Um, that's one of the reasons I moved there. Um, I think that's enough for me. Thank you very much. We'll go to Dan Paulson. Okay. Um, one of our, our biggest assets and what I hear why people want to live in Grand Rapids is because they're, they feel safe. Um, again, we are voted the third, third, or not voted, but we are the third safest community, okay? And, and that, that is a big part to be from our police department with the sheriff's department too. You know, we don't want to leave them out because time and time again, they have assisted us in um, whether it's uh, car accidents or, or scenes um, that need more personnel than Grand Rapids can provide. And they are, they've, they've been, had our back for ever since um, I was um, on that fire department. They're always there for us. Um, also, like I said, um, w there's not a lot of industry in Grand Rapids because we cannot supply the water source and, and the sewage uh, sewage, but the uh, disposal that, that they sometimes need. But what we do have is great subdivisions. We have good roads. You know, we have a great park, Wazicha, Nepco, whatever. We have a community that people want to raise a family in. And that's very, um, we're very proud of that. And that's one thing that we need to tout and, um, and let people know. They want to move to Grand Rapids. One, our tax rate. Compare our tax rate to the city. Compare our tax rate to uh, to Barron. Okay. Again, Ben said it earlier. We have the lowest tax rate um, among them, and we have plus the recreation. We got our bike trails. We have our beaches and um, snowmobilers. We have our uh, snowmobile paths or trails going through Grand Rapids, and we promote um, activity from the YMCA, the uh, community picnic, and all sorts of uh, activities. Thank you, Daniel Paulson. Ben T uh, Tilburg. Thank you. <coughs> I, I think we really have uh, two, two great assets in, in Grand Rapids. Uh, first and foremost, uh, Lake Wazicha is at the heart of our community, and it is, is a fantastic asset. Um, hiking, biking, walking, uh, you name it. There's two campgrounds, two beaches. Uh, what a great place to be. What a great place to take your family. Uh, uh, people look for a peace of mind. Uh, when they leave work, uh, where, where would you want to go? Do you want to go to your living room? Do you want to go take a walk? Uh, lake Wazicha has a, a, a trail around the entire lake. That's fantastic. It gives people a peace of mind. They need a place to go after that busy, busy day. Uh, the second asset that we have uh, is, is Mid-State Technical College. Uh, we are extremely proud that Mid-State Technical College is, is a part of Grand Rapids, and that's a very important piece uh, for our residents. Uh, we have access to classes, we have access to training. Uh, we work mutually with police and fire department uh, exercises at Mid-State Technical College. As a graduate of Mid-State Technical College, I am elated that we have such a, such a great resource in the area to be able to capitalize on education uh, for our families, for our children, for our future children. And, and, and so I, I just think Mid-State Technical College and Lake Wazicha are, are just fantastic assets. Thank you. Thank you very much, Benjamin Tilburg. Patty Lumby. Well, one of the things that I um, like is that we're so close to um, town or a city that we can hop in our car, we can go to fast food restaurant, we can go to see a movie. We don't have to take an hour to drive um, to get, um, you know, city amenities. Also, um, we're 
Lake Wazicha, of course, I agree with everyone as far as the Lake Wazicha is um, one of our greatest assets, along with I believe that we have really good drinking water. Um, even though we don't have a, a city sewer type of um, situation, um, I think we have really um, excellent water. Um, the Mid-State Technical College, in fact, uh, we met um, with the Plan Commission last night and um, they're looking at expanding also. So that is really makes me happy about that. Um, and then foremost is the affordability, um, the safe, clean, and very spacious lots that we have to live in. Thank you. Thank you, Patty Lumby. This will be our last question and we begin with you, Dan. What would you do in the area of repurchase agreements? There again, um, we have a phenomenal treasure, um, Chris and town clerk and Judy, and I trust them completely in what they do. Um, I don't think a lot of people realize how much work that they put in to maximizing um, the return on our money because like, as Arnie indicated earlier, there are times of the year when, when there is substantial um, funds that, that we're holding, you know, and um, I would leave that to them. I, I trust their opinion, and um, that is a day-to-day -day operation, and they, they have their finger on it. And, um, and I think they do a phenomenal job. All of our uh, town employees, and especially in, in the office, uh, the gals from when you come in to, uh, and Judy and, and Chris, um, they work together as a team, and I would, I would, like I said, trust their management of it. Thank you, Mr. Paulson. We'll go to you, Ben Tilburg. Uh, as far as the repurchase agreement, uh, I, I would have to uh, fall back on, on Chris and Judy's experience um, with, with dealing with this. I, I personally have not had any, any um, experience with repurchase agreements. However, that's why, that's why we have great people. If you have great people uh, behind you and with you, um, you can defer to their knowledge and their expertise, and they will take you, they will take you through to the ultimate decision, and, and that's a very important thing. Surround yourself with good people, and good things will get done. Thank you. Thank you, Ben Tilburg. Patty Lumby. I agree with um, the statements also that uh, Chris and Judy have done well with the uh, repurchase agreements. Um, one of the things that I do vote yes on um, continuously is promoting education, continuing education, um, in order to um, continue doing uh, the good job as a support team for the town board. Thank you. Thank you, Patty. And Ray Onesti. I think it's been beaten to death, but it's been well mm -hmm. taken care of. Thank you very much. We're gonna begin with closing statements and we'll begin with you, Ray Onesti. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> I have such stage fright here. I have no voice hardly. Um, I don't even know where to begin. Um, I grew up on a farm in Wittenberg. I learned responsibility early. My father died when I was 15 and we had to run the farm. Um, we worked hard. I was an Army veteran medic in, in the 25th Infantry in Hawaii. Graduated from Mid State Technical Institute in 1979. I have worked at uh, Riverview Hospital as a respiratory therapist for the 37 years. Um, I believe that I have the qualities and the attitude to uh, try to do this job. I obviously have a lot of knowledge to gain and um, studying to do to even do the job. Patty and Paul obviously have the advantage because they've been in the job, so it's really hard to jump in here and, and be knowledgeable about all of this at this time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dan Paulson. Okay. First, I'd like to thank again the League of Women Voters, WFHR, um, Community Access, and my fellow um, candidates uh, for participating in this forum. It was a lot funner than I thought it would be going <laughs> <in>. <laughs> and, and uh, went pretty well. Um, my last two years on the board was educational, to say the least. Um, 
you see the ins and outs and you know that those board meetings that happen for one two sometimes three hours Arnie <laughs> which could um, are just a piece of what they're working on behind the scenes the committees that we're involved in um, just the research talking to different members of the community and that to find out what what is really going on and and why so sometimes when when you see us up there and there's a motion and a vote and you think it's uh, um, bing bang boom and you're done but there has been a lot of research behind it to um, um, to get to the to where we were at that meeting which um, which has very been very educational everywhere from budgets um, to how we can maintain a tax um, levy that we can support our community service. I mean, there is a lot of work behind it. I would like to thank um, our chairman, Arnie Nystrom, for helping us as new board members for the last two years. Um, he has always been there, understanding, and um, he has provided phenomenal leadership uh, to this board. Um, I'd also like to thank the town uh, employees. We have a super group of people from from the ladies who when you walk in the door to Judy to Rick and uh, Jake and Mike who who keep those roads plowed. Now they have some part-time help too and it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work that you be behind the scene. So um, I hope to continue to uh, to be your board supervisor and please vote for Daniel Paulson on April 7th. Thank you very much. Not Dan. the eighth, the seventh. seventh. <laughs> Thank you very much. Benjamin Tilburg. Thank you. Uh, as I look back at the last few months, I, I am uh, very fortunate to have met uh, a bunch of great people uh, through this whole process. Um, I'm, I'm excited and enthusiastic to be able to, to sit and listen to residents and act as a board member uh, in the town of Grand Rapids. Uh, I. I've, I can provide leadership uh, and a voice uh, for the people uh, in my age group whom sometimes aren't necessarily represented on, on boards, uh, not maybe due to lack of experience or, or uh, they're taking care of their families. Um, however, I'm excited and I am extremely enthusiastic to be able to bring my daughter and my son my sons along with me on the campaign and meet people throughout the community it's truly been a blessing I think I think involving your family in this process is one of the greatest greatest things I can take away from this right now and and I hope I help others uh, take this opportunity in the future uh, to serve the residents of Grand Rapids because it's truly it's truly a service and and that's a and that's a thing that uh, volunteering or serving is something that you can never uh, regret that experience. Um, I would be honored to serve the residents of Grand Rapids as a supervisor and I hope you vote for Ben Tilburg. Thank you. Thank you very much. Patty Lumby. Thank you. In my service to the town as supervisor these past two, two years and resident of 51 years and property owner of the town for 29 years I've learned that it's been that a balanced evaluation and debate of needs is required in order to address the challenges in maintaining the town's budget without incurring additional debt and allowing each department to have an adequate working budget. I take this responsibility of fiscal stewardship very seriously and I try to analyze each request thoroughly. I too believe that it is my responsibility to safeguard the community its legacy, and the community's investment. I believe that our police and fire department and EMS teams do a fantastic job protecting us and making us feel safe. With everyone's involvement, we can continue the legacy of Grand Rapids as being an affordable, safe, clean, spacious community to live in, formulating an environment which will entice the younger generations to start their families here and sustain an environment which the elderly can live in their homes as long as possible. Thank you League of Women Voters for hosting this candidate forum. Also I'd like to thank River Cities Community Access for broadcasting this forum as well as the monthly Town of Grand Rapids Town Board meetings. 
please vote April 7th and reelect me, Patty Lumby, as one of your next Town of Grand Rapids supervisors. I will serve you well, and thank you other candidates. Thank you, Patty Lumby. This concludes the first portion of our candidate forum. The next part of our forum will feature uh, candidates for the Wisconsin Rapids Common Council District 5 and the Nakusa School Board. Stay tuned, it will take us just a few minutes to uh, reassemble here. And again, I wanna thank all of you candidates for running for office. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Welcome back to the second portion of our candidate forum. The two candidates on the April 7th general election ballot for Wisconsin Rapids Aldermanic District No. 5 are Andrew Kirkpatrick and Stephen Koth. Stephen Koth was unable to appear here due to a previous commitment. Mr. Koth does have an interview that is taped with River City's Access and will be rebroadcast before the election. Thank you, Andrew Kirkpatrick, for appearing here tonight. And we will start with uh, Andrew's opening statement. Thank you. Uh, first off, good evening to those who are here this evening and those watching from home listening on the radio. And uh, as been said all evening, thank you to the League of Women's Voters and RCCA Media and the other local media outlets for hosting and covering tonight's forum. On April 7th, the citizens of the District 5, Wisconsin Rapids, will be asked to select once again their city alderman. I'd be honored if once again you would choose me to serve you. Since first taking office in 2009, I've taken my responsibilities very seriously and have conducted myself with, a, with integrity, respect, and conviction at all times. I've served on all three of our standing council committees, human resources, finance and property, and public works, uh, with uh, varying amounts of times on each one. I've also served most recently on the Industrial Development Commission. Over the years, folks have contacted me, and I've taken their concerns, your concerns, to the appropriate committees, city staff members, or to the full council where appropriate. I put a great amount of time, effort, and personal research into the items that come before council, and I've made difficult decisions on what I feel has been in the best interest of the city and its citizens. My wife can attest to the amount of time that I put in. Sometimes she doesn't see me for several evenings in a row as I'm doing research at home. It's these things, my professionalism, and my ability to make decisions that make me know that I'm the right person for this important responsibility. That's why I thank you for your support that you've already shown me, and I humbly ask for your vote on April 7th. Thank you. Thank you. Our first question, and I want to remind our listening audience on WFHR uh, and our viewing audience to please phone in questions uh, at 715-423-0441. Here's our first question. I had it here. Here we go. What would you do to support the mayor's councils on youth and st sustainability? Ah. Well, the uh, Council on st Sustainability, when uh, former Mary Jo Carson, uh, mayor, was uh, in office, I served on the, let's see if I can get it correct here, the Clean Green Welcoming Committee, which in many ways mirrored the efforts of the uh, sustainability efforts that uh, Mayor of Ruwink has put into place. So the thoughts, ideas, and eventual outcomes that came out of our committee uh, at that time, I believe that that's going to be a lot of the same things that we're going to see come out of the current committee. So I'd support those endeavors. Also with the student youth council committees, I was very excited to see the area youth get involved and bring forward uh, proposed legislation which we enacted at the city level here in the last three or four months. I've also been excited to see youth serving in a uh, uh, somewhat of an advisory role on the city council. They're not necessarily all that talkative at times but um, you know they're 16, 17 years old and I don't want to say that it's over their heads. I think they've got a good grasp of what it is that we do and the things that we talk about, but I think sometimes they're perhaps a little bit nervous to share their opinions and their insights. And so I hope that an environment like a youth council will help the youth of the city get their ideas across in a comfortable atmosphere for them. Thank you. Our second question. How do you feel about local regulation of e-cigarettes? Um, E-cigarettes, I guess I don't really have much of an opinion on that one. Um, the smoking ban that went into effect statewide back, uh, oh boy, what was that, 2010, 2011, somewhere around there, I think that was appropriate at the state level. We were talking about it at the city level at that time. I didn't really feel it was appropriate at the city level. 
There was also some ideas floating around of banning cigarette smoking on uh, uh, public sidewalks, public parks, things of that nature. I don't necessarily agree with that. I'm not a smoker myself. I dislike it. I really like the state ban. Um, but as far as e-cigarettes go, I don't think that they really pose um, like a secondhand smoke health concern. I haven't heard of any uh, information, seen any articles that talked about any health concerns secondhand wise. Um, I don't think that that's necessarily the city's responsibility at this point to delve into that until uh, more evidence would come forward. We would be uh, otherwise asked. At this time, I think that would be uh, a state measure. Thank you. Uh, we are asking questions of Andrew Kirkpatrick, uh, the alderman for the 5th District. His opponent will be Stephen Koth on the April 7th general election ballot. Question number three, what are your thoughts about the Tribune building project and would you promote projects like that to promote projects like that to promote citizen engagement? Oh yeah, um, the Tribune project, I think uh, what Encourage is doing down there is absolutely incredible. Uh, they have been working for the last couple of years now engaging citizens in Wisconsin Rapids, in the outlying area, you know, Port Edwards, Nakusa. All these citizens are coming together right here in Wisconsin Rapids to take now an underutilized building on prime real estate and really seeing what it is that our citizens want out of that facility. What, uh, what do we think is lacking in our community? Not from a council perspective, not from the minds of eight people, not from the minds of one mayor or five or six city, city staff, but from the uh, thought process of hundreds of residents. So I think what Encourage is doing there has been absolutely incredible so far. I think uh, Encourage is gonna come before the city further. They've already come to, uh, to the city and asked for our support when it comes to uh, grant applications, using the city's name on grant applications as required by state law. They have come before the city and asked to purchase property. Uh, the parking lot, as many would, uh, would remember, was kind of a hot button issue here just a few weeks back. I'm happy to say I voted in favor of that, I spoke in favor of that, and I'm glad that they got that city parking lot. That's now going to be theirs to help get that project moving further forward. And uh, I'm really, really excited to see them come back to the city in the future with more plans, more ideas, more requests so that we can evaluate those uh, on a case-by-case -case basis. And I hope that this project is a model for further projects in the city for other organizations as well. Thank you. Our next question. For what manufacturers and or businesses enterprise do you see as qualified for Wisconsin Rapids and what skills or ideas do you have to bring them here? Well, we, uh, we have got Mid-State Tech College that does a great job out there with their programs. So we have got many qualified um, individuals at school graduating out there. We've got many qualified individuals within the city that have left the mill, have left the workforce that would get back into the workforce if the opportunity came to them. I think we have got a huge workforce trust, a, a great wealth of individuals in this community that are capable and willing and have the knowledge to go to work in just about any sector that, uh, that would come before us. Right now, um, as I sit here tonight on the 24th, I can't say that we necessarily have got uh, people beating down the doors to come into Wisconsin Rapids. I think the Reggie Initiative is showing us some of our shortcomings in this community as far as um, buildings and properties. I hope that we can continue to capitalize on what it is that we do have, our strengths in our uh, water, our utilities, our power, uh, also our industrial parks, our quality of living, our quality of life. And really, as far as what businesses qualify for Wisconsin Rapids, I am, have been, continue to be, and always will be open to engaging any business that would come to Wisconsin Rapids on a professional level and just be excited to work with them to see what it is that we can do 
to get them into our community. Thank you. Uh, what are we on number four, I believe? If you were forced tonight to name one area of city spending that you would investigate for cost-cutting measures, which would you pick? Hmm. You're being that's, forced. I'm being forced. That's, uh, that's a tough question simply because going through the budget process um, each year, you know, I, I read the budget from cover to cover when it comes out. And... I believe that our mayor and also our uh, planning and economic development director, our city treasurer, um, all of our department heads do a great job in identifying their current needs and also their future needs so that the city can budget for them. Um, that's, that's what makes this such a difficult question. We have got really great department heads and really great directors that are overseeing public funds and doing their utmost to use those as wisely as possible. And I believe that just about every time that we do a project, we come in at or under budget. There are some that do run over cost. That happens, I think, no matter where you are, private sector, public sector, anything. But unfortunately, I'm sorry to say to name one specific place that we could cut a bunch of money. Um, and still maintain the services that the citizens of our community desire and demand of us, I think that would be a pretty tall order. Thanks. Uh, recent data indicates a significant median household income difference between the east and west sides of the river. As councilman, is this something to address or, or can you address or how can you address the growing disparity? I guess we've never really had it presented to us in a east versus west side um, economic disparity before. You certainly do have uh, council members that say that, you know, we tend to forget about the west side. Maybe that's true. Um, I think one thing that the east side has going for it is that's where we have had most of our TID districts, our TIF districts, our economic development districts. We do have the West Side Industrial Park, which has seen enormous expansion, enormous growth, and uh, last I recall is almost at complete capacity. So I really don't know what it is that, that we could do to level the two sides of the river. Um, I think that's going to come down primarily to private enterprise, to private citizens um, making investments in their own neighborhoods, in their own properties. If somebody would have, uh, have some kind of an idea as to ways to address it, I know I, I'm not going to speak for every council member, but I would be willing to entertain that. And I would be fairly certain that the other council members and the mayor would be willing to entertain those ideas as well. Thank you. Uh, what will you do, what can you do as a council person to make or have Rapids be different than all of the other cities that are facing tough times and competing for limited development opportunities? Yeah, that's, uh, that's <laughs> tough. Um, Rapids is, is not unique. Um, the Reggie Initiative, uh, Regional Economic and Growth Initiative, they came before council here just this past month and provided just a snippet of some of the research that they have been doing. And they identified uh, our community as being very similar to other communities around the state. And one community that is similar to ours that most people are not going to think of is Appleton because they've taken a hit in their manufacturing sector when it comes to paper as well. Um, so when you look at economic development and you realize that now suddenly Wisconsin Rapids is not just competing with maybe Marshfield and, and Stevens Point, but we're competing directly with places like Wausau, Kakana, Appleton, it makes it a lot more difficult. So we need to make sure that, uh, that we are on our best game and that we are making sure that if a developer does come before us that 
we're getting a proper incentives package put forward to him. Because sometimes, as Reggie said the other night, we can't take a B game and make it into an A game just based off of an incentives package. But sometimes that can be enough to sway somebody, to sway a developer to come into the community. I think we've always done a good job at being, one on one hand, stewards of the citizens' resources, the, uh, the taxpayer dollars, and on the other hand, um, ensuring that we put out a competitive um, package to developers. I think that's right now, without further information from, from Reggie and on these economic initiatives, I think that's, uh, that's where we're going to get our best bang for our buck, is making sure that we have got the best economic package possible when someone comes to us. Thank you. Uh, what is the number one issue you believe is facing the 5th District of Wisconsin Rapids, and what can you do about it? Um, you know, I, I don't really see – there's districts to a city, but I don't really see it as one district versus another district. I don't think that any one district has got any one problem that any other district doesn't have. You know, we're not uh, – we're not New York City, you know, there's not the Bronx, there's not Brooklyn, there's not Queens, and there's not all these different large neighborhoods vying and competing against one another. We're, we're a township of 18,000 people. Um, if you hit the street lights just right, you can shoot across uh, rapids in under five minutes. So to say that District 5 has problems that District 1 has, or that uh, we need to have some type of different economic advantage over another district. I think one, that's, that's not accurate. And two, to pit the districts against one another can be calamitous. Um, we need to be thinking about what can we do as a whole, as a collective, as a community to better ourselves, not as what one district can do better than another one. Um, on a simple level, I'll say that Chad Whirl over in District 1, the alderman there, has done, uh, done impressive work with cleanup efforts in his district. I think every district can, uh, can do cleanup efforts and can do you know, a, a clean sweep. Um, but as far as pitting one district against one another for economic development or anything like that, I'm not in favor of that at all. I'll never entertain that. Thank you. We have two more questions for Andrew Kirkpatrick, the current District 5 uh, alderman. He will be facing Stephen Koth on the April 7th general election ballot. Uh, do you foresee uh, putting police and firefighters under the tenets of Act 10 in Wisconsin Rapids? I kind of figured that was going to come up. Um, I don't really, you know, this, this was something that was done by the governor. This was a state level decision. This was not a, a city level decision. So Act 10, um, from a management perspective on the city level, was in some ways a good thing. All right, we've saved money in some places, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it was that it was overall a good thing. All right, so now we've got uh, clerical, we've got public works, we've got all these other unions that are not subject to collective bargaining laws, bargaining rules. So we've got two different classes of city employees, which I don't really like, I don't agree with. Um, I think from my perspective, the best thing to do would have been an all or nothing approach. Either everyone went under Act 10 or no one went under Act 10. Um, this community has got a strong history of, of union stewardship through the mills. And I think that still runs deep. And I think that that, uh, that unionism in our community is what helped to build a strong, vibrant economy that we had from the 70s to the 80s to the 90s. And so by pushing everyone into um, Act 10, I think is you know, nearsighted. I think in the short term you, you see gains, but I think in the long term it's only going to serve to hurt us. Um, but as far as what goes on there, that's going to be a state level decision, and the city unfortunately just has to do what the state tells us to in those situations. I, I wouldn't necessarily support it, I wouldn't like it, but it's what it is. 
Thank you. Our final question. Uh, what would you do as councilmen to encourage and streamline the permitting process for building permits? And the questioner is saying that right now multiple permits are required for electrical, plumbing, concrete, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, one thing that's kind of nice is that we've been able to take some of the um, questions through the city website and we've been able to put some of that information out there on the website on the new Grow Rapids portal. So some of these permits, you can get these questions answered on the Grow Rapids portal. So that takes City Hall's boundaries and it, it really puts it in your living room or in uh, a business owner's conference room. So that's, that's an advantage that we're finally getting to use. As far as streamlining those efforts, um, you know, I, 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 that's, a, that's another tough question only because we have got specific codes in place for plumbing, for electrical, and that's, that's state law, that's city ordinance, and that's how you ensure that you've got buildings that won't fall apart, won't start themselves on fire. That's how you ensure that you don't have apartment buildings that don't flood the downstairs neighbor when you take a bath. So as far as streamlining that, I think perhaps some of that's going to come down to the contractor and their timeline, and it's going to come down to uh, the individual that's looking to take out those permits, making sure that they're getting out there at the appropriate times and thinking forward and saying, okay, in two weeks I've got this contractor coming, I should go and I should pull those permits today, or I should have pulled those last week. Um, I know that Adam Teagan's office is constantly looking at their permits and uh, and the whole process he does his due diligence and I believe he's doing a good job at that um, I don't necessarily know that there's a silver bullet to streamline the process to get everything done in one shot though thank you closing statement please certainly once again I want to thank the league and RCCA local media outlets for hosting tonight of course thank those that are here in attendance tonight viewing and listening at home also, a special thank you to my supporters around the district, around the city. For those in the district who signed my nomination papers, have put signs out in their yards, and thank you to those who have opened their doors for just a moment as I've walked through the neighborhoods meeting and greeting residents. I uh, thank and appreciate the questions that have come forward tonight uh, and have thoroughly enjoyed the opportunity to keep you informed of my thoughts uh, and also some of the things that we've been working on here over the last term. I hope you found it informative and uh, hope that you've got a better idea of who I am, what I've been doing for our community, and what I think we can do for our community. If you're on the fence tonight about me, I hope that you would uh, believe that you know you can give me your trust. I hope that I've earned your trust. If you still have questions, please contact me. My phone number, 715 Four two one three seven three two. I work all day, so leave me a voicemail. I'll get back to you, I promise. Or you can find my email address on the city website. Or you can find me on Facebook, Andrew Kirkpatrick, 5th, 5th District Alderman. Last thing I want to do tonight, simply ask residents, please, go out and vote, April 7th. Again, I'd be honored if you would select me once again to be your council representative. Andrew Kirkpatrick, thank you. Good night. Thank you. Andrew Kirkpatrick, uh, the current 5th um, District Alderman, will be facing Stephen Koth on the April 7th general election ballot. Stephen Koth was not able to appear due to a previous commitment. Um, thank you again. And we will be returning very shortly with three candidates for two positions on the Nakusa School Board.
Welcome back to the final portion of our candidate forum. We are featuring the three candidates for the Nakusa School Board. They are competing for two positions on the April 7th general election ballot. Thank you to our candidates for appearing here. We have Brian Mahan, David Schmidt, and Bob Shear. Uh, I want to invite questions from our listening audience on WFHR and our viewing audience at home. That phone number is 423 0441. Earlier, our candidates drew for speaking for their two minute uh, opening and closing statements. So we will have David Schmidt first. Thank you, Karen. Um, I'd uh, like to thank the League of Women Voters to start with for inviting us to come to uh, this forum and uh, tell about a little bit about the uh, school district of Nakusa and also for uh, the Community Access Channel and WFHR for broadcasting this so that. Uh, you folks at home can can uh, hear a little bit about us and understand what we're all about on the Nakusa School Board. Um, I've served as a school board member for the last six years, over two terms, and I'm encouraging fa folks to get out and vote this year, and I'd like to have you vote for me again. I uh, have served well, I believe, in uh, the last six years at, this, at the Nakusa School Board. Uh, we've, we've gotten a lot of things done over those last six years. Uh, some things are still in the process of being completed and we need uh, a little more time to get that finished and I'd like to be part of that. Um, I mentioned the last two times that uh, I came before this group that uh, I'm here to um, help the kids of this, this district of Nakusa get a better education. I have uh, several grandchildren now that are attending schools in uh, various schools in our district and um, I want to get them the best education that I can and in the process that'll mean that all the schools, all the students in our schools will get the best education that they can get. Um, I've worked very hard to uh, uh, ensure that that'll happen and I'm encouraging you all to get out and vote and uh, vote for David Schmidt. Thank you. Thank you. Bob Shear. Well the other day I was asked why am I doing this again? and. I turned to my friend and I said, because there's a reason to. I've got 10 years in rural education, supporting rural schools, the small ones, the ones that are barely making it on the budgets we had then, and we're seeing decrease even further now with the current governor's budget. Then with my six years on the Nakusa School Board, I saw a district that spent a lot of money to be average, and then watched the general fund, or the fund balance, I should say, go down to $300,000. We weren't fiscally responsible. We weren't quite getting the job done. And there were other agendas present at that. And once that started up, I had to vote the way my heart voted. So um, in that process of my six years on the board, I think I've accumulated more no votes on spending and other projects that probably didn't fit good with my interpretation of how rural schools were going to be ran and how the funding was going to be f for our school. It's not rural, but it's bigger. So whatever happens in the rural schools, as far as funding and money, that happens to the bigger schools. It just takes longer for the bigger schools to feel the effect of dwindling funds. Taxpayers that can't afford to live and pay for what we're doing. So I like to stay on the board fact I'm hoping you let me stay on the board so I can try to cut back on some of that spending so we can keep you in your house and lower your taxes somewhere down the road thank you thank you Brian Mahan thank you I just want to take this opportunity to introduce myself as I am currently not on the Nakusa School Board uh, I am a near lifelong resident of the Nakusa School District I graduated from the Nakusa High School in 2002, graduated from the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point in 2006, and graduated from the Mid State Technical College Law Enforcement Recruit Academy in 2007. I've worked full time for the Juneau County Sheriff's Office, the Town of Rome Police Department, and the City of Nakusa Police Department, where I've been for about the last five years. I'm also certified by the State of Wisconsin Department of Justice to instruct various topics as they pertain to law enforcement. I'm seeking election to the Nakusa School Board 
because I'm passionate about ensuring that our children receive a quality education. I'm looking forward to bringing with me a positive attitude and working to create an atmosphere that promotes community involvement. Thank you. Our first question will go to Bob Shear first. Briefly describe what you believe the relationship should be between the school board and superintendent. We talked about this the other day, and uh, we all had different opinions. And with mine, I'm going to base it upon the 14 administrators I worked with in the past and the two administrators I worked with on the board. Administrators should be a partner, but it should be a partner that communicates back and forth and, f and shares ideas. And if there is some spending going on or if there are some decisions that go are going to impact the students, we should know about them ahead of time rather than find out at a meeting. I can honestly say that in the three years that we've had, in the last three years, we've had very few meetings with our administrator to say, what's coming up? What are we going to do? How's our spending? We've had very few subcommittee meetings. In fact, I don't think we've had one, maybe two. Okay, we'll have two. But they're hard to remember. So if we're going to be a partner, um, we have to bridge the gap between the administrator and us. We cannot just go forward and follow an administrator because then you would just be a board that just follows. If you want to be a board that is a companion to leadership, collaborate, then it's time for th those discussion to happen on a regular basis and let's have those subcommittee meetings so we can discuss the funding, the policies, and other things that are coming up in our community because we have to work as a, as a team, not just that we're going to follow one guy until we know what happens. Thank you. Thank you. Brian Mahan. Well, I agree that we it should be a, a working partnership uh, between board members and um, district administrators. Um, we should be able to freely share our opinions, as should the administrators of the district. Um, and we should be, be able to be open open to sharing our feelings and um, not be afraid to um, voice differing opinions because uh, sometimes that leads to the to the best outcome in the long run um, a, a strong partnership we we pick the people that we feel as administrators would uh, make our community better and as long as we are open with each other and encourage uh, community involvement in the process as well, I think that's a good thing. Thank you. Would you like the question repeated? No, I think I've got it. Okay. Uh, uh, I think uh, what the other gentlemen have said is very true. We need to have a good relationship between uh, the school board and uh, the business building, uh, the administrator, administrative position. Uh, I th I've worked with two different administrators since I've been on the school board. Uh, our most recent one is uh, Terry Whitmore and uh, he's working very hard to uh, try to make us uh, have that kind of a relationship with uh, the school board and with the community. He's working out in the community to uh, try to establish trust and viability for our schools, bringing in more students because uh, we're trying to be the place to be in our schools. And um, I think we have established a pretty good relationship with him. Uh, not always, uh, like Bob says, uh, things come to us uh, ahead of time, but uh, most of the time we're uh, informed uh, about what's going on in the district and uh, in fact I just came from a meeting this evening uh, a joint meeting with the uh, Coosa School Board and the City Council in the Coosa where we're uh, discuss discussing uh, things that we might do to make the uh, city of Nakusa a more uh, pleasant place to, to live and to work and uh, bring more businesses in and more students therefore to fill our schools uh, and Mr. Whitmore is the one that initiated that uh, meeting and he's uh, I think he's working very well with the school district right now thank you thank you our next question will go to Brian Mahan first what are your views on trying to keep the school portion of the property tax at the same level or even reduce it for the property owners in the school district uh, well that's a question that I, I'm sure is uh, brought up often and uh, 
it is important to keep uh, keep taxes uh, low, but it's also important to uh, maintain a quality level uh, of education for our students. Um, and that's something that the board, the community, uh, need to work together on. So if there are needs um, that are apparent in the community, uh, it, it may not be possible to keep taxes as low as some citizens would like, but that, that again is what we need the community involvement for to help us uh, in making those decisions. Thank you. David Schmidt. Uh, well, in fact, this, this year we were able to uh, reduce our property taxes to our communities. Uh, we serve not only the city of Nakusa, but the city, the town of uh, Saratoga and the township of Rome and the township of Port Edwards and, uh, and uh, Armenia. Uh, we were able to drop our mill rates this year 1.7% uh, so that the taxes to those uh, families uh, went down this year. If you look, notice on your tax bill, uh, taxes went down this year. At the same time, we were able to initiate a remodeling project at our schools, and all three of our school buildings are being remodeled at the, at the present time. We've, we started that remodeling project last summer, and will continue through this year and finish up in the year 2016. Uh, we're repairing uh, damaged things that have just been left uh, idle for a number of years because we didn't have the funds to, to uh, do those projects. We've uh, replaced windows, uh, we've replaced roofs. Uh, we'll be doing some some landscaping and some other things, some lighting. Uh, some of that projects, some of those projects were done uh, by a, a state law that allowed us to use money uh, f with uh, energy efficiency and uh, we're able to do that this year without raising taxes. In fact, we are, we're able to lower taxes and uh, we're working on a, a, a limited budget, but uh, as Bob said before, uh, we, we, we came in on the, at the school board, we had about a $400,000 fund balance and our fund balance uh, because of uh, some frugal budgeting and uh, some, of some other th reasons, we, we've gotten our fund balance up well over $3 million and working to try to get it up to four so that we don't have to borrow, short-term borrowing anymore to, to, meet, to meet expenses. Thank you. Thank you. Bob Shear. Can I have a question again, please? Absolutely. What are your views on trying to keep the school portion of the property tax at the same level or even reduce it for the property owners in this school district? It's kind of interesting because I, when I paid my taxes, I looked at the part where it said school tax, and mine went up $22.43 right off the tax bill. And when I was getting my car service, I talked to a couple of gentlemen I know from Rome, and uh, they said their taxes went up, and they're very concerned about it. So I went back and I started looking and the property tax down in Rome, for instance, I, like on King's Way, this is a nice street, the school portion is $2,627. Well, my total tax bill is 3724 So I start looking at the other ones. And I'm seeing that they're spending anywhere from, we'll say $1,400 all the way up to to 26, uh, 2,627, so their taxes are high. And that's because of the state funding formula and how their, the properties are taxed and everything. So I went to Archer's Way. Well, they're paying 2,000 or 3,139 or 1,896, depending on the lot, the house, and whatever is assessed at. I had to go way off water to find a tax of 1,209. So we haven't been doing them a favor. We have, we have approved uh, energy spending projects. The first one, and then the second one, we're, we're at $12 million that we pushed onto, the, onto their taxes. Granted, AMS was being paid off, so we were offsetting one debt with another debt, and we didn't give them a tax decrease. We didn't give, I didn't give myself a tax decrease. So I'm not seeing how we're helping them by doing what we did and how we're spending. So I think we do have to get the spending in line a little bit and then see if we can just freeze the increases in taxes on the school side. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question will be posed to David Schmidt first. What is your view on the Common Core State Standards? Oh, that's a tough one. Common Core State Standards, uh, the governor right now is uh, saying that he's not really much in favor of Common Core <laughs> State Standards. Our school 
uh, administrators and some of the teachers at least uh, like the idea of using the Common Core sta uh, state standards. Uh, I'm really not uh, educated enough to know exactly what that is, uh, so I'm not really uh, going to say one way or the other. Uh, I know that our school district is, uh, is using it, and to change to another form of uh, standards right now would be very costly. So I think we're going to be stuck with the Common Core State Standards, at least for, for the time being. Thank you. Bob Shear. Well, the Common Core, from what I understand by reading, because I haven't seen the textbooks, I haven't really talked to the teachers a lot about the concept, but it's a nationally formed uh, curriculum or goals of the curriculum, and then we have to find the textbooks that will implement it, and then we have to train the teaching staff to use it. So if, if we're going to say Common Core is good, or bad, we have to say, did we get the right books? Did we get the training for our staff? Does, is the staff able to use the curriculum they're being forced to use to the eff effectively? So I really am concerned about it. I would like to see a math textbook. I would like to sit in a math class and see what's going on because I've heard good and bad. And I've looked at some of the math scores up on the uh, state website, and I'm kind of concerned about that, the English, and a few others. but. Uh, I'm going to see how this plays out because it's his first year and I want to see if this is better than the, tr the other core math program we had that was just terrible and that was sh just shoved on us. So I want to see how the core curriculum math is different than the traditional core that we had before and see if it's actually going to improve the students' chance for post-secondary or for the tech schools. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the question is, what is your view on the Common Core State Standards? Brian Mahan. Well, uh, David is correct that the, the Governor Walker has um, voiced his displeasure with the Common Core Standards. And uh, I'm, I'm very similar to David when, I, when he said he's not educated enough in the topic, nor am I educated enough in the topic um, to provide, I guess, an educated answer. I would say, however, that in situations um, where we analyze a state mandate or a national mandate, we need to trust our administrators and their knowledge um, and advice in the, in the topic. Um, they're certainly the ones that uh, we pay to understand this for us, and we need to place our trust in, in those people. Thank you. Our next question will go to Bob Shear first. What can the school board do to attract talented teachers when openings arise? Well, the first thing you have to do is create an environment where people want to come in. I mean, let's stress having an open environment that shares concepts and ideas and where teams can work together as a group to build their curriculum and then to get the scope and sequence of going from grade level to grade levels and encourage the teachers to do some thinking out of the box. Uh, get them to say, hey, what about this and how can we imp implement it and then test it out. Because education is one of those tools that I've learned through the years. If you have a teacher that has a desire to teach and they want to do something a little bit different, check it out. Let's see what they can do. They might have a different uh, outlook on how to teach a math class, an English class, or a social studies class or a topic. So let them be free to think and then let the group, the group of teachers at that grade level say, let's embrace it or say, how can we change it? I'm also a fan of trying to get teachers to just be creative. I don't want a mandate where you have to do this topic on this date, this topic on another date, and set it up to go sequentially based upon the day of the week. It's just not my way. Thank you. Thank you. Brian Mahan. Well, Bob is, is right in that we need to create an atmosphere that attracts quality educators to our school district. Uh, but I don't think that is just uh, school, school-wide. We need to work as a community uh, to develop strategies um, to bring, to make people want to live in this area, to bring these educators to this area. Um, and once they're here, we need to 
uh, continue to develop this community and our schools to make them want to stay here. Now, the Nakusa School District may not be able to um, compete on all compensation packages um, or incentives, things like that, but we need to work as a community um, to attract and retain these educators. Thank you. David Schmidt. Would you repeat the question uh, once more? Yes, I was going to do that. Uh, what can the school board do to attract talented teachers when openings arise? As a matter of fact, uh, we've already initiated some things to do that uh, in the fact that we've uh, started to create ownership for the, for the teachers uh, and support staff as well. Uh, with the advent of Act 10, uh, there was a whole lot of different things that we were allowed to do with the financial packages that uh, would help the stu uh, teachers to receive an, a financial increase. And we formed a committee that I, s that I sat on that uh, helped to develop a, f a package for uh, funds that they could, uh, for in uh, pay raise increases. And uh, the teachers actually developed the, uh, the format that we uh, are currently using. And the couple of us that were on the school board that sat in on those meetings, uh, we're there just to kind of keep things flowing and uh, the teachers bought in to the idea of doing it because it was their uh, their plan and a lot of the teachers are really happy that they can have part of this have ownership of the school district uh, this was such an innovative uh, thing that uh, we were very much on the cutting edge of developing a format for financial increases after Act 10 and many school districts around the state have copied our uh, initial format to formulate their own uh, financial packages and so we're kind of proud that we were initial in getting that started. Thank you. We will have two more questions this evening and the uh, first to last question will start with Brian Mahan. Are you committed to the concept of charter schools in Nakusa? Would you renew the charters of those schools? Well, learning uh, should be focused on individual learning. Not all students learn in, in the same manner. And uh, my understanding is that these charter schools allow us to teach um, to an individual's way of learning. And um, the answer to that question is yes. I, I would encourage anything we can do to teach the, to the individual student rather than just teaching to an assembly line of students. Thank you. David Schmidt. Uh, yes, I, uh, that's a, a subject that's near and dear to my heart. Uh, since I've been on the school board, I've been instrumental in trying to get a charter school started in Nakusa, a, a project-based charter. Uh, the the scar charter school that we have started that it began in September this year uh, is for grades three through seven. Uh, I was uh, privileged to be able to travel to several different schools around the state to, to initiate some information about uh, how these schools uh, ran and uh, what we could do to get one started for us and would it, would it be something that we would be uh, able to use. And we have found that uh, there's a lot of kids, like uh, Brian said, that just don't learn by sitting in a desk. They, they, they don't focus that well. They learn better by getting their hands dirty and getting involved in the projects. Uh, so our school started in September uh, with grades three through seven. Uh, we have voted to imp in, uh, expand that school to grade eight through the next, uh, starting in September, with the possibility that after that in 2016, uh, we might uh, expand it to the high school as well. These kids need an, a, a, an opportunity to learn like they l know how to learn. And the, the school right now is, is thriving very well. We initially planned to have 50 students in our charter school. Uh, and we have 61 or 60 or 61, I forget which, in the school right now with uh, the option of having uh, that many again next year, but expanding it to one more grade. We also have a uh, Nakushra school, a charter school, which is uh, geared to the uh, Native Americans and helped to be funded by the Native Americans. Uh, that's a, that has a smaller number of school students, but they also work with project-based education. And these, these kids just eat it up. It's a really good opportunity for them. And I'm really proud that I was initial in getting this thing started. Worked many, many years to try to get it going. So thank you. Thank you. 
Bob Shear, would you like the question? Oh, yeah. Okay. Are you committed to the concept of charter schools in Nakusa, and would you renew the charters of those schools? Currently, there's two ways to look at it. If, if you look at it as a charter, as a, an incubator, where you can bring out a different educational concept, project-based learning, and other concepts like that, that is a great incubator to use to develop the curriculum, the material, and to actually get it implemented into a school district so it can be for everyone, not just a fixed group. Because what my concern will be that somewhere down the road, there will be a change in political parties. And then all of a sudden, the leadership will say, you know what, we're going to do away with charters. And we are going to do away with funding for charters. So now you've got this dual curriculum that you got currently in, like, our middle school, where you've got the charter and you've got the regular. And then the taxpayers will say, how am I going to support a dual curriculum when I'm having a hard time supporting one and staying in my house? So I like that idea of charter as long as it's funded and as long as it's used as an incubator to improve education for everyone. But once it became, becomes on the, on the back of the taxpayer for sole support, then the charter is harder to defend. So, and plus a charter, if the charter goes outside the district, the money from those students will actually go to that other charter so we could actually lose if their charter has not belonged to the Nakusa School District. So there's a, there's a double edge to it. It's a good incubator. It's good while it's being funded, but once it's not being funded, are you going to be able to say, no, we're not going to do the charter because we don't have the charters anymore because of the legislature? And are we going to then incubate, uh, inc put it all into the regular curriculum? So that's the hard part. What's the future? It could come and go within the next election. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this is our final question this evening, and it will start with David Schmidt. If you would choose one area of school spending in Nakusa to investigate for cost-saving measures, what would that area be, and what might be your approach to save money? That's a good question. There's always a uh, need to save money in, this, in the districts. Uh, many districts in our state are uh, having a financial crunch. Uh, we may have uh, a shortfall of, of funds again this year. We don't know what the actual budget's going to be. Uh, but we're uh, able to uh, cope with it right now. We do have a fund balance to uh, be able to pick up some of those shortfalls. Uh, there isn't really much we can cut from our school districts. Over the last, uh, up until probably 2010, uh, for 25 to 30 years, every year we were cutting programs and cutting staff and it was a terrible thing to have to do in January to issue pink slips to people that worked in the district for many years and now they weren't going to be having a job and that was the worst part of the job when I first came on the school board is having to uh, vote to approve uh, laying off people. Uh, in recent years we've stopped the bleeding. We have not laid off any staff members. We've had some retirements and some people left the district for other reasons, but we have not had to lay anyone off. And I'm very proud that uh, on my watch, we've been able to stop the bleeding. So um, as far as cutting anything else, uh, we're down to bare bones right now. Uh, if it came down to having to cut something, um, um, I don't know where we'd go right now. Thank you. Thank you. Bob Shear. Okay, as I run down the list of our spending, we cannot reduce spending on the buildings. The brick and mortar have to stand up. They have to support what's going on in the educational opportunity going inside the building. So the buildings are not the place to cut. In fact, we have been trying to improve them so we can get more life out of them. If I look at spending on educational staff and support staff, I'll combine them. We've got a good team of educators and support staff. You, we've when I first got on the board, they were being let go and other, and other agendas were going on. We finally have stopped it. We're building a team of support staff and teachers that need to stay. We cannot just say they're going away like we did the last time. That was a mistake. Then we look at what else can we cut? Athletics? No. Our athletics have been cut. We're trying to, to sustain what we have, so we cannot do athletics. 
if we're looking at utilities, well, we're doing energy saving projects to save utility costs on lighting, electrical, water. I mean, we're trying to do our best there. So I think the big thing will be is try to slow the rate of spending on growth. We have to slow that because that's the only thing that we've got left. Slow the growth and maintain what we have until we get an upturn in state funding. When you have a projected loss of $178,000 and that's just state funding, we don't know what the feds are going to do. We don't know what the other associated special ed reductions might be. So we have to reduce how much we're spending where we're going to make sure that we don't overspend and start dipping in the fund balance and go start going backwards. Thank you. Thank you. The question is if you could if you would choose one area of school spending in Nakusa to investigate for cost saving measure, what would that area be and what might be your approach to save money? Brian Mahan. Well, I don't want to talk about the uh, cutting things, um, especially things that the community needs. I think the the approach that should be taken is developing a strategy um, with board members, community officials to attract families uh, and students to the area, uh, increase our student population, um, which in turn would increase uh, state funding to the schools. If we can uh, develop a strategy to attract open enrollment students, this would help um, and hopefully alleviate any need um, to cut. Thank you. And thank you, uh, everyone, for the questions, both uh, uh, listening, viewing, and in our studio audience. It's time for closing statements from the three candidates for Nakusa School Board, and we will start with Bob Shear. Thank you. Well, thank you for moderating. It's been fun. Uh, I'd like to thank the League of Women Voters, WFHR, and the RCCA. It's, it's one heck of an event. I look forward to it every three years. Thank God it's not yearly. Um, the big thing that I want to walk away with is telling the voters there we are trying our best to watch what's going on in the district. We are trying our best to try to keep up with what's going down in Madison and how it's affecting the district as a whole. When you have budget cuts coming based upon what's going on with politicians down in Madison who kind of forget where they came from or you get a political party that's got an agenda onto its own we do our best to cope, just like you do at home with your budgets and, your, and how you're trying to handle the family budgets. I'm very concerned that we have to try to do a good job to balance school operational costs and the community's ability to pay, whether it's in Rome, the Coos, or Armenia. We also have to look at retaining the good teachers and not give them the, a reason to leave. We have to retain them because good teachers are hard to find. And I've seen them. There's very good teachers. And the impact of charter and voucher schools, that'll be an interesting concept to watch and how it's going to affect school budgets and how the state's going to handle it. Because now the DOA will be, Department of Administration, will be in charge of vouchers down the road. And we know who the head of the Department of Administration is. He's trying to think about running for president. So all this is going on and I'm here to say I want to give you the best school district we can and still save you tax money give you a break try to find a way where we can stop it slow it or just hold the line thank you thank you Brian Mahan I also would like to thank the League of Women's Voters for inviting us here this evening um, I just want to say that I have dedicated uh, nearly all of my professional uh, career to serving the citizens of the Nakusa School District. And I'm hopeful that I can expand my service to the community as an elected school board member. Uh, if elected to the Nakusa School Board, I would like to focus on improving and ma maintaining the safety inside of our schools, um, attracting and retaining quality educators, improving communication between school board members and community officials, and developing a strategy to make the Nakusa School District an attractive and influencing factor in bringing families to the area. 
I am confident that I can have a positive impact on the Nakusa School Board uh, if given the opportunity. And I ask you to please consider casting your vote for me on April 7th. Thank you. David Schmidt. Okay, thank you uh, to the uh, League of Women, Women Voters for inviting us here and for uh, Community Access and WFHR for broadcasting it. And for you, the folks that are listening, uh, to uh, pay attention to what uh, the issues are in the school board right now. Um, I have served for six years, as I mentioned before, uh, on the school board, uh, been on different committees. I've served as the representative for a CESA 5 uh, representative. I've also been, for, for the last six years, our uh, Wisconsin Association of School Boards representative at the convention that they hold, uh, where we uh, present issues to the, book, to the convention as a whole that are lobbied at the state level. Uh, and so I've served in that capacity. I uh, am a thorough believer that education is, is uh, something that is impo important. So I take every opportunity to attend um, uh, practic uh, important uh, meetings that are held around the state by the WASB organization and other organizations. I attend uh, forums with uh, other school boards. We've had several recently where uh, a number of school boards from the area get together and t discuss issues that are common that we can maybe work together to try to solve for our school districts. Um, and still, the reason that I'm running is for the children of our school district. For my grandchildren, I want a better education for them, and therefore, again, for the rest of the students in the school district, I want to serve to uh, help those students to get a better education. I think I've done that over the past six years, and I encourage you to get out and vote on April 7th, and I wish that you would vote for David Schmidt. Thank you. Thank you. A thank you to Brian Mahan, David Schmidt, and Robert Shear for your willingness to run for public office, serving your community, and appearing here tonight. Uh, these three are on the general election ballot for two positions on the Nakusa School Board. This concludes our League of Women Voters Candidate Forum. We have a lot of thanks uh, for Tom Laux, the coordinator, uh, and uh, Dave Ballerstein, the multimedia coordinator, and Travis Plowman, the other multimedia coordinator of uh, the River Cities Community Access staff. We also want to extend a thank you to Carl Hilke at WFHR Radio. And I want to thank uh, the League volunteers here tonight, Mary Jo, Yvonne, and Gloria for giving up an entire evening to, to have the forum. Um, thank you at home, listening and viewing and in our audience. And please vote on April 7th. Thank you.